Hey you guys, welcome back to Flickers of Fear, going back to the 1960s on this one. So I wanna say, I guess, like most horror fans worthy of the name, <laughs> I suppose, I'm a big, gigantic fan of Vincent Price and I will watch pretty much anything that he's in. Uh, the man was just a legend. He absolutely never phoned in a performance. He was always worth watching and he always classed up whatever movie he was in, no matter how inexpensive the production was. I mean, he was just like a class act overall. I'm also somewhat familiar with the works of Nathaniel Hawthorne. Uh, I read a couple of his novels and several of his short stories over the years. I think even when I was doing uh, The Witching Hour, I read several of his short stories on there. So, you know, I'm kind of familiar with his work. Not super familiar, but you know, a little bit. And as you guys know, I love, love, love horror anthologies. There's just something that's really, really appealing uh, about horror anthologies to me. So you know that eventually I had to get around to watching and reviewing a movie that ticks all three of those boxes, which is 1963's Twice Told Tales. So this movie was produced by a company called Admiral Pictures, uh, which looked like it was a pretty short-lived company. They didn't really put out that many movies, and it looks like most of the movies they put out were westerns, at least going by the titles. Um, though, I will note that they had released a psychological horror movie called Diary of a Madman, which also had Vincent Price in it, uh, which came out in 1962, which is actually on my list because I want to see it. I've heard it's pretty good. Like I said, it's like a kind of a psycho ripoff, but I've heard that it's a, a really good one. So Twice Told Tales, the movie we're talking about today, was actually direct, directed by uh, Sidney Salkow, whose resume goes all the way back to, I think, 1936 or something like that. Uh, and he would actually go on to work with Vincent Price again in 1964 with The Last Man on Earth, which, of course, was the adaptation of Richard Matheson's I Am Legend, which we reviewed not too long ago. So it seems like the idea to do an anthology film based on classic stories came mostly from the success of Roger Corman's Edgar Allan Poe adaptations, obviously, which were really successful. Now, at this point, all, all of them hadn't come out yet, but there had been House of Usher had come out in 1960, uh, Pit and the Pendulum came out in 1961, and Tales of Terror, which was an Edgar Allan Poe anthology film, uh, also came out in 1962. All of those also had Vincent Price in them because he was just everywhere. Uh, since American International Pictures and Roger Corman and everything seemed to kind of have a corner on the market of Edgar Allan Poe stories and they didn't really want to repeat it, Admiral chose to do something a little bit different. Different. So they're like, well, we're going to mine, you know, the works of another American dark romantic writer, like in the same vein, like of the 19th century, who is Nathaniel Hawthorne. And I kind of feel like probably nowadays he's best known for his 1850 novel, The Scarlet Letter, which I don't know if they're probably still reading it in school. I read it in high school. I actually quite liked uh, the book, um, but, you know, I know a lot of high school students don't like it, but I actually quite liked it. I read it in 10th grade, I think. Now, Hawthorne did actually publish a short story collection, which was called Twice Told Tales in 1837. Uh, the reason it was called Twice Told Tales was because it was all stories that had appeared like in other publications prior, like in magazines and newspapers and stuff. Um, but interestingly, only one of the stories that was adapted for this movie, uh, Dr. Heidegger's Experiment, uh, was in that anthology. The second story, which is uh, Rappuccini's Daughter, was actually you know, published again in various periodicals, but then it was collected in the 1846 book, which was called Mosses from an Old Manse. And then the third one, The House of the Seven Gables, was actually a very loose adaptation of, of course, the standalone novel, which came out in 1851. Now, while the movie Twice Told Tales, I think it does suffer a little bit from its, you know, clearly very low budget. Um, I think it's slightly too long. Um, clocks in right about two hours, and I think probably maybe 15, 20 minutes could have been trimmed out of there. Um, it's not a big deal, but you know. Uh, and they did take some liberties with the source material, and I kind of have mixed feelings about that. But it's still a pretty solid watch. I mean, Vincent Price is in it, and he's in all three of the things, like playing a different role, but he's always a villain, and it's always like fun to watch him be a villain and also has some very welcome appearances by some other great actors like Sebastian Cabot and Beverly Garland who I absolutely love she worked with Roger Corman a lot as well also turning up for all you MST fans out there <laughs> Because Beverly Garland was actually in a lot of movies that were on Mystery Side Theater as well. But also turning up in a significant role is Brett Halsey. Now, he had been in a fuck ton of movies. He was in a lot of westerns and things like that, like going back to, I think, the 1940s, maybe. Um, or maybe just the 50s. I can't remember. But I immediately recognized him as Bix Dugan, a.k.a. Big Stupid, <laughs> from The Girl in Lover's Lane from 1960, uh, which was actually one of the more decent movies that was appeared on Mystery Science Theater 3000. 
2000. Um, I actually think that was a pretty good movie. They did as well. Uh, Halsey was also in, this is very interesting, uh, several later Lucio Fulci films, including Demonia and A Cat in the Brain, like the late 80s, early 90s Fulci, like, you know, not too long before he died. So, you know, it really is kind of a small horror world after all, isn't it? So the first story, which is Dr. Heidegger's experiment, uh, sees two old coots, uh, one of whom is named Carl. This is Dr. Heidegger of the title, and that's played by Sebastian Cabot. And Alex, who's played by Vincent Price, they're kind of like meeting at Carl's house during a th really bad thunderstorm to celebrate Carl's 79th birthday. Now, we learn that 38 years prior, uh, Carl's fiance, Sylvia, died on the eve of their wedding, and Carl has never really gotten over it. He keeps a very badly done portrait of her, like above the fireplace, and has never even touched another woman in all the years since, which, okay. Uh, even creepier than that, though, uh, he also has a crypt right outside the house, like he can see it like from the window, that has her body in it, and it also has an empty coffin in there, like all ready for him when he inevitably like pops his clogs. So healthy, not really, but you know what I mean? He's not hurting anybody, so whatever. So the storm, or perhaps some kind of supernatural force that's not really made clear, actually causes the crypt door to sort of like blast off, to like kind of fall off, which it's never done, obviously, in the 38 years since it was put there. And Carl goes over to investigate the damage, uh, taking a very reluctant Alex with him. In the crypt, they find out that Sylvia's coffin has kind of like slid off the platform that it was on, but as they're trying to put it back on there, the lid comes off and there's Sylvia's dead body, but it looks fresh as a daisy, even though you'd think after 38 years, she would just be like, you know, a crumbly old skeleton at this point. So Carl, who I think is, who's like a scientist, uh, he deduces that the water that's been dripping down into the coffin from the spring above the vault has maybe like restorative powers and tests this by bringing he kind of brings some of the water back to the house and then he has this old like smushed like pressed rose that he had like that Sylvia gave him 38 years ago and he's kept it pressed in a book. So he puts the water on it and it pops back to life as if it's alive again. So after that, he's like, well, shit, what would happen if I drank this? So he drinks some of the elixir and becomes young-ish again, like, you know, maybe in his 30s or something like that, whereas before he was 79 years old and he's you know, overjoyed, obviously, we found like the fountain of youth. Uh, now he and Alex will be able to have another whole entire lifetime of their awesome friendship. Alex also drinks some of the water after he sees that it didn't kill his friend uh, and turns back into Foxy, younger Vincent Price, because obviously they've put like old makeup on, which is actually pretty good now that I'm like thinking about it. Now, they're both pretty jazzed about this situation, as you would be. But then Carl remembers that even if he gets to live a whole other lifetime um, and actually maybe could be immortal because he's like that, you know, that spring has been running there for like 38 years. So why should it stop now? We can just go drink more if we start getting old again. Um, but he still doesn't have his true love, his one true love, Sylvia, by his side. But he thinks, what if the water doesn't just restore youth? What if you could also bring somebody back from the dead? So yeah, you know how this is gonna go down. Uh, they, spoiler alert, <laughs> resurrect Sylvia after 38 years in her grave. Uh, she's actually pretty cool with it. Uh, takes the whole thing in stride after they explained her and she's just kind of like, oh, okay. Uh, and she just goes along with it, which I thought was kind of funny. Even though, I mean, like the last thing she remembers obviously was, you know, it was the eve of her wedding and she's like, oh, I don't feel too good. I'm gonna go lay down. And then obviously she died. So that's like the last thing she remembers. She still thinks it was 38 years ago. Now, anyone with any knowledge of, at all of uh, horror tropes will pretty much see where this story is going from like a mile away, you know, because there's gonna be all kind of like double crossing and shit's not, Sylvia is not the person you thought she was and all this other kind of stuff. Like I said, I figured it out, but that didn't really like dampen my enjoyment of it. And I think this was actually my favorite of the three adapted tales. I will note, however, uh, if you guys used to listen to my witching hour, I believe I did actually read this original story like on that series. Um, so I will note that it is very, very different from the original Hawthorne story. What happens in that is that old Dr. Heidegger has received some kind of ma a magical like fountain of youth water from Florida, or so he says, and he gives it to three of his friends, who are like two men and a woman, uh, as an experiment. Now the trio become young again, but then a bunch of like kind of long forgotten jealousy and resentment concerning this old love triangle that they had going on uh, starts rearing its head. They have like a big brawl or some kind of like fight or something like that. And the flask that holds like the last of the water gets broken and the three of them kind of revert back to their elderly selves. Now it's been a while since I read it, but I was of the impression that the water 
never did actually make the three people young. I interpreted it as Dr. Heidegger's experiment being maybe testing whether he could make them think they had grown young, like through the power of suggestion. So I thought it wasn't even so much that the water was magical. I thought that he was seeing if he could make them believe it and could make them see themselves as young, even though they actually weren't. But I could be totally pulling that out of my ass, but that was just the impression that I got when I read the story. If you've read it, like, tell me if you think that if you got that impression too, because that's what I thought it was. But I don't know. It's kind of left ambiguous. Um, but in the original story, anyway, you know, nobody gets brought back from the dead and nobody gets killed. So I kind of appreciate, like I said, and this was, was what I meant when I said I kind of have mixed feelings about, like, the liberties they took with the source material. In this case... I don't think that a, just a straight adaptation of the original story would have been all that scary because the story isn't scary. It's not like a scary story. It's more like, I don't know if I'd say it was like funny, but it's just kind of like poignant maybe. Um, so it's not actually really a horror story. So I kind of like that they just took the germ of the story with the magical water and like making them young again and stuff like that and then try to like horror it up some because they were obviously trying to make this a horror movie like in the vein of the Edgar Allan Poe ones. Now the second story, Rappuccini's Daughter, is actually the most faithful to the original Nathaniel Hawthorne story. So it's set sometime in the 16th century in Padua, Italy. And you got sinister ass Vincent Price playing Giacomo Rappuccini, who's a scientist of some kind in the story. I think he's a botanist, which I'm assuming he is in this as well, although I don't think they say that. And he has this kind of like real lush garden outside his villa. And it has, you know, lots and lots of plants. But then it has this one particular plant that's like really, or it's like a bush or something, um, that's kind of like really weird looking. And it's super, super poisonous. And it has like all these like spiky purple blooms on it. And it seems to kill anything that touches it, uh, whether human or butterfly or caterpillar or whatever the hell. Now, Giacomo has this gorgeous but mysterious daughter named Beatrice, who never re leaves the confines of the villa or the grounds and has never been seen by the townsfolk. They all know she lives there, but nobody's ever seen her. Next door to the Rappuccinis, however, uh, there's this young student named Giovanni, who's played by the guy from The Girl in Lover's Lane. Now, he's renting a room like he's a university student, and his window happens to overlook the garden. So he sees Beatrice one day and is immediately smitten with her. But she is like super reluctant to get to know him. And she basically warns him, like, look, you never, ever come down to this garden. It, you know, it's going to end badly. Now, they do carry on kind of a bit of a friendship. They don't only really show this, but it's kind of implied where she's down in the garden and he's up in the window and they have like these long conversations and stuff. But Giovanni is starting to, like I said, essentially like fall in love with her. And he's starting to get curious as to why she's kind of keeping him at arm's length and won't let him come down to see her. So one day he essentially must his way into the garden, uh, much to Beatrice's horror. So Giovanni is just kind of like, hey, what gives? Like, I thought we were friends or I thought we were, you know, having a thing or whatever. So she tries to explain to him what the deal is. She's like, okay, well, you know how my dad is a crazy person? All right. So Nutty Professor Dad, uh, played by Vincent Price, has essentially been harvesting the deadly kind of radioactive toxin from the weird purple plant in the garden for decades and or however old she is and infusing her blood with it, basically making her touch poisonous to any living thing, like any person or animal. He started doing this, she says, after her mom ran off with another man when Beatrice was just a baby. So the dad was a little bitter about it. And he says, well, by making the daughter like unable to ever touch another man without killing him, I will be able to essentially save her from ever sinning like her mother and keeping her pure. And also this isn't stated outright, but imply that it's like, she'll never leave me, which is a little bit weird. Okay. Giovanni obviously doesn't uh, believe this at first uh, and neither would you if somebody said, hey, uh, I got a poison touch. Uh, you know what I mean? Uh, uh, but Beatrice actually demonstrates by touching a lizard and essentially like cooking it alive, like right in front of his face. So she begs Giovanni, please just forget about me. We can never be together. Um, you know, I can't touch you or I'll kill you. Now, Giovanni loves her so much that he goes and consults another scientist at the university to see if he can come up with an antidote. Meanwhile, Giacomo, the dad, while at first predictably discouraging the relationship between Giovanni and his daughter, because like I said, he just wants to make it so like she can never touch another man because of the because of, you know, the hoe that the mom was, I guess. He later seems to have a change of heart and claims that he has a way for them to be together and it's OK for them to get married. 
uh oh, like I said, because he's a villain, so you know this is gonna this is not gonna be a good situation. Uh, this story was pretty good too, although I kind of wish that the filmmakers had made it a bit creepier. I really do love the idea of this kind of like affinity between this poisonous plant and the poisonous woman. I thought that was like really cool. And like I said, that's directly from the story. This is very, very similar to the original story. But some of the horror I think was kind of undercut by having almost all of the action take place in the daytime. The garden set was actually like cool, but it would have been a lot eerier I think like in the dark. So I kind of wish there'd been more stuff going on at night, but oh well, what are you gonna do? Um, as I mentioned, the segment is almost in almost exact retelling of the original story. So if you've read that, um, you'll know how it ends up uh, badly in case you couldn't guess. Now the third segment uh, probably deviates the most from its source material. Now I read the novel, The House of the Seven Gables many years ago. And while I liked it, it wasn't as horror-y I guess, as this adaptation made it seem, which is kind of like what's going on with a lot of these. Like I said, I feel like they were trying to make it more horror to compete with the Poe pictures, but a lot of Nathaniel Hawthorne stories aren't overtly horror, you know what I'm saying? Uh, so while the movie, like while this adaptation keeps the core elements of the book intact, you got like the long rivalry between the Pynchon and the Mall families. You got the search for the missing papers, the land deed or whatever. You have the accusation of witchcraft and the subsequent curse placed on the males of the Pynchon line by Matthew Mall. Uh, the rest of it was pretty different and exaggerated. Most of the characters and plot threads from the novel were either taken out or were like changed around. I guess that was probably like the best route to go in this situation um, as the novel is like pretty long and complex and has like a lot of historical backstory and all this other kind of stuff, which obviously you couldn't cram into it because this segment of the movie is only 45 minutes long. Fun fact, Vincent Price also starred in another adaptation of The House of the Seven Gables back in 1940, which is actually a lot more faithful to the source material, although it also took a lot of liberties. I don't know, I haven't seen that many adaptations of House of the Seven Gables, but most of them usually do take some artistic license with the story. Because like I said, the story as it's written, it's a good book, but it's not real cinematic, you know what I mean? So in this truncated version that's in Twice Told Tales, Vincent plays a guy named Gerald Pynchon, uh, who is actually not a character in the original novel. And he's kind of like this scheming a-hole who comes back to the titular House of the Seven Gables after 17 years away. I believe that they don't, I don't think they actually like explain why he's been gone for that long, but I think in the book, maybe his equivalent in the book was like in prison. I don't know. It's like I said, it's been a long time since I've read it. Now, his sister, Hannah, who is also not a character in the novel, although there is a woman in there named Hepzibah, who I think is kind of like the equivalent, um, she's lived in the house the entire time, and she's not real happy that her conniving brother has come back to the homestead after all this time, especially after it seems that he mostly bankrupted the family. He was like a gambler or something like that. Now, the house supposedly contains a vault, which has this valuable property deed in it, that will make Gerald and Hannah, who are the only two remaining pensions, rich again. But generations of the pension family have been looking for this damn thing for, you know, ages and haven't been able to find it. Now, by the way, 150 years ago, the pension family fucked over the Mall family, accusing a man named Matthew Mall of witchcraft and getting him executed so they could take his land. This part is pretty much right from the book. Uh, the very land, in fact, where the House of the Seven Gables now stands. Now, Matthew placed a curse on all the male descendants of the pension line, uh, ensuring they will all die. In the movie, it was with blood on their lips uh, in a particular chair in the house. I think in the book, if I remember correctly, the curse was God will give them blood to drink, I think was what uh, he said. So this curse has been 100% effective so far. But Gerald, who is the last male pension, is certain he can buck the trend. And what's more, he thinks that he has an angle on how he can locate the vault after all this time. During the course of this plan, he contacts Jonathan Mall, who is a descendant of the rival family. He's trying to make peace and hoping he can trade the house. He's like, I will give you the house if you tell me where the vault is. See, what happened was that the house itself was actually built by the brother of the executed Matthew Mall, like, you know, whenever, like a long time ago, who was the only architect in town. And because he was justifiably uh, pissed off at the Pynchon family for getting his brother executed, he was like, yeah, I'll build your house, but I'm gonna hide this vault where you shit heels will never be able to find it. So there. Um, also put the crypt, Matthew Mall's crypt, like in the basement, which again was a little fuck you to the family that he hated so much. 
So Vincent slash Gerald's plan seems to be moving along, but dif difficulties soon start to manifest themselves. I neglected to mention that Gerald has brought along his wife, Alice, played by the lovely Beverly Garland. Uh, this is also not a character from the novel, who immediately, when she comes to the house, she starts experiencing kind of like paranormal phenomena, like doors opening by themselves, uh, hearing her name called or hearing someone else's name called, which, you know, we'll get into. There's kind of cold spots, knowing things about the past that she has absolutely no way of knowing. Now, when Jonathan Maul arrives at the house, like after Gerald calls him, she seems to already know him, even though she's never met him before. And it's implied that the long dead Matthew Maul is actually trying to communicate with her, like paranormally through Jonathan, who is his descendant. Now, it's been a long time since I read the novel, uh, you know, admittedly, but I don't think any of that was in the book. Um, and I have to say too, that the resolution of the story in the movie is a lot different than the ending of the novel, which as far as I remember was like kind of a happy ending. This does absolutely not have a happy ending. Not, well, not really. I mean, it's kind of happy for a few people involved, but you know what I mean? It's kind of fucked up too. So this was also a pretty entertaining story. Although, as I said, it's wildly different from the source material. And like the first segment, Dr. Heidegger's Experiment, uh, the changes made were almost all in service of making the stories more horrific, which I find I can't really complain all that much about. I mean, some of Hawthorne's stories were ghost stories, absolutely, but most of them weren't really kind of like all out horror in the way that like Edgar Allan Poe's stories were. So you can see why the filmmakers wanted to try to increase the scare factor, I guess, like in this anthology by adding a bunch of elements that weren't in the original stories. I didn't really mind that but I'm just gonna say like just a pro tip please don't watch this movie instead of reading the stories like if you have to write an essay for your English class or something like that because you will absolutely absolutely get an F. Now if you're into Vincent Price and like who isn't really uh, and you like classic American literature and you like anthology horror movies you will probably dig this one um, it's not as good as Corman's Poe cycle movies it's a little bit slow in places like I said they probably could have trimmed out like 15-20 minutes without like losing too much like you know kind of up the pacing a little bit it. But all in all, um, I actually found it pretty engaging and fun. And I mean, not gonna lie, like Price is always just a joy to watch, especially when he's playing bad guys, which he is in three different roles in this one. So, you know, you get three Vincents for the price of one, and I'm not gonna complain too much about that either. So that will do it for this Flickers of Fear, and I will see you guys on the next one. Bye!